Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm Kim Coleman. I'll be your host for the next three hours here at WP Accessibility Day. I've been in the WordPress community for over 15 years. And when I'm not supporting community events like this, I'm working on my membership plugin, Paid Memberships Pro. I'm excited to announce our next session, Excel Accessibility Testing in the CI slash CD process with Maciek Palmowski. Maciek spends his days at Kinsta as a development advocate analyst. After hours, he spends most of his time trying to find interesting news for the WP Owls newsletter or cycling. Please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A tab in the chat area, and we'll answer them at the end of this session. You can also use the ideas section to chat with other attendees. So that's it for me. We'll welcome Matt Jack to the stream. Hi, Kim. Uh, first of all, Kim, big thanks for pronouncing my name uh, so nicely. I know it's not easy, so kudos for you. Uh, so uh, before I start, I want to start with a small anecdote uh, because uh, when I subscribe for, uh, I submitted my talk for uh, the WP Accessibility Day, I was so sure I submitted for the lightning talk. And I was kind of surprised that, uh, of course, I made a mistake. Uh, so uh, I can say that this will be the accessibility testing as a part of CI the CD process, the extended version. So yeah, let's talk about how to automate it. Uh, as Kim mentioned, my name is Maciek Panowski. I work at Kinsta as a DevRel, but uh, at heart, I am a developer. I always have has been a developer. Uh, so mm, this, I think, brings a bit different perspective uh, for me, uh, especially in this accessibility space, because um, I won't lie, uh, accessibility wasn't a uh, thing that I was interested in for quite a while, but it changed. It changed at some point. First of all, um, there were two reasons uh, that cause that I got interested in accessibility. First of all, I'm a cyclist. And I don't know if you've ever been in Poland, but uh, the infrastructure there isn't the best. So on and on, I had, a, I had to uh, either carry my bike or uh, move from one place to another in, in, in quite different, in, in quite weird manner. Uh, in short, um, it wasn't something easy and I started to understand that okay I am I am a cyclist it's not a big problem for me but for some people it might be also I became a parent and um, again together with my wife we don't have a car we mostly use either uh, public transportation or we are using our bicycles or going on foot so but thanks to using a stroller we we kind of understand how some disabled people have to has to feel using the whole city infrastructure. It's a horrible experience, and it really, really opened my eyes because um, I understood that um, while at some point our kid will stop using the stroller, we don't have to, we we won't have to uh, go around with it uh, all the time, but we never know what will happen tomorrow. Maybe some of us will will, will, will get into an accident or something and uh, will be disabled for the rest of our lives. And we will have to um, live in this infrastructure. And this, this, this was really a true eye opener for me that it's really worth investing in accessibility uh, because you never know what tomorrow will be so uh so so so, so this was uh, this were the reason why i got interested in the topic uh so first i want to tell a bit about how this how accessibility testing look from a developer perspective so uh the sad news is especially at those places i had a chance to work with uh sadly it doesn't uh it's uh yeah, just just like that. Because um, for more most agencies, uh, accessibility is a separate task that is in most cases left on the on the end of uh, of, of of the whole process. Uh, also, 
in many companies still don't fully understand who should be responsible for it, who should take care of it. For some reason, I saw that many companies like to push it only on developers and they still don't understand this very important argument that uh, accessibility is provided by everyone in the team. Every part of the team has to add something from the design, through developers, through the content team, because accessibility is something more than just a few lines of code or an overlayer, like some companies try to convince us. Uh, also, quite often there is this sad argument that we have more important things to do. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, at least uh, I see that in Poland there, there is this change that every public site has to go through these WPCAG uh, norms. Uh, and uh, this was the first time when all the, the, where many companies start understanding that accessibility is a must because without it, they won't get the money. So while this is a bit forcing uh, those agency to get interested in accessibility, it works. So it's good. And the constant problem, the lack of education. I mean, um, developers have to learn all of their life. There are so many new technologies, so many new things that appear every day. And um, I can understand why some of them just don't have the resources, the time to continue education in another field. Um, but again, that's why everyone in the team should take care of accessibility thanks to this, uh, like a hive, uh, such an agency or company should learn accessibility just step by step. Or is, I mean, from my perspective, I see that sometimes it's enough to understand the problem just not to pretend that it doesn't exist just to try to know that it's there and it will already be easier to uh, to, to continue with, uh, with with your own education so uh, i mentioned this weird term in the title cicd what does it mean cicd is nothing else than continuous integration slash continuous deployment or development and uh, it's not a tool, it's a methodology of how we work. And uh, while it can be a bit complicated uh, at some point, the whole idea behind this is very simple. It's all about constant testing. So every time we um, create a change in our code base, we are running all the tests that we have. A typical developer would say, okay, so we will be running unit tests, functional tests, and to end tests from different sites, from PHP, from JavaScript. But hmm, why not to add one more test to the equation? Maybe let's add accessibility as one of them because, well, a test is a test, so there, there, there is no difference. And of course, it's also responsible for the build and deploy process. And it's also very important that without passing the test, we never will deploy our application or our website to production, which would mean that if we would add accessibility testing as a part of this CICD, uh, um, as, as part of CICD, um, if we will encounter uh, an error from the accessibility point of view, we won't push it to production because it's an error and we shouldn't push pages with bugs, right? Uh, what are the problems? First of all, no one is using it. At my previous company, because uh, before Kinsta, I work at Body, which develops a CI CD platform, and I was responsible for our uh, for, for, for trying to get uh, people from the WordPress space a bit more popular about uh, deployment automation. And uh, I learned that it's not so popular, especially that WordPress is pushing more and more towards this no-code, low-code approach. Although the big companies, the big agencies uh, are using CI/CD, so uh, yeah, 
it's here. It's here, just it's not as popular as it should be. Uh, also, many agencies and companies will say that we have more important things to do, which is kind of a weird argument because um, I would make it, we have more important things to do than waste our time on repeating manual actions, but it's their choice, their money. And the uh, last very popular argument, we don't have time, which results to we don't have time to automate our tests, but we will have a lot of time to fix everything on production, their choice. And how we can add accessibility testing to a pipeline? It's very simple. Uh, thanks to CLI tools like XCLI, P Accessibility, or Google Lighthouse, uh, we can test our website just with just by installing it and passing a few arguments, mostly the URL of the website we want to test and some configuration file. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, and this is how a pipeline can look like, a true enormous pipeline. You see, we are running all the tests. We are running PHP stand, PHP unit, integration test, deploying to staging server. Then we are running the XCLI. Then we are running some other tests. And what's important, if any of those tests at some point fails, we will never reach the last step. So transfer files to production. So if there is an error somewhere, it will never reach the production. It's very important. And this is an example how, uh, how an uh, X can return uh, uh, error if, if, if it will find one. For, I was testing the dequeuniversity.com and uh, we can see that there was a violation of duplicate ID active with one occurrences. That's it. We, we have a we have a bug, we know where, where to find it, and we know that the action failed. So if we would be developing the site, it wouldn't ever reach the, the production until we would fix it. And this is on what we are doing. So what are the biggest pros of automating uh, accessibility testing? First of all, if and the problem is I cannot find this tweet, but I remember that the Q, so the company behind X uh, responded on, on Twitter to me. Then they mentioned that uh, we can find about 60% issues that way. That's great. That's the ma majority of issues there, there are. So amazing. On the other hand, the testing will always, always happen in the background. So every time we will push our change, the tests will run. There is no way uh, that we can prevent it. And on the other hand, we can just push our thing uh, and start doing something else. The test still will happen. Also, it's a great way to get a very quick response whether the app is good to go or not. Of course, let's remember, in the 60% of issue that it will find. So I would consider that um, CI that this automatic testing can provide us with, a, let's call it a good enough approach. If it passes, it's good enough, although we still should take care of the rest. And for me, I think this is the most important thing about uh, this automatic testing. Uh, it can be a true eye opener for many developers because like I mentioned, this testing will happen, whether whether the developer wants it or not. And if at some point uh, such a developer will see that uh, this website has like 100 errors, that's not something good. And uh, but after the initial frustration, uh, yeah, the, there is 100 bugs. We can create tasks. We can start fixing it. And while fixing them, we we can learn. So if someone didn't ever cared about accessibility, uh, seeing this log full of errors might open, uh, might open some eyes and uh, change the approach towards accessibility. Of course, there is no, this uh, automatic testing is not a silver bullet. We can only find 60% issues that way. So there are still 40% issues left. 
So this means that no, we won't automate everything. We still have to hire people that uh, that know how to deal with accessibility. Uh, also, those checks only happen when we push a code change, only then. And uh, so if we are developing something, uh, we are kind of developing it in the dark. That's why it's also important to, to use other tools. I will mention them in, in, in a moment. Uh, it's also important to explain why we added uh, those tests, because uh, I mentioned there is a huge possibility that if you will run it for the first time, your website might not be too accessible, especially if you never, uh, never set a priority on it. And when you get a return of 100 potential errors to fix, you might get a bit frustrated. You might get mad, and this is this is why it's important to to tell why we are doing it, why accessibility is important, and uh, but yeah, this is the role of, uh, of 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 the agency of the company. That's it. But like I mentioned, there are also browser tools, and probably most of you are using them. Just a quick example of how X works. Probably most of you uh, use it every day, but just to make sure. So we are just testing the wordpress.org website. And after a few seconds after pressing uh, the button to scan our, uh, our site, uh, we will get the list of all the issues. Uh, we see their, their descriptions, where they are located, what to do to solve them. Beautiful. So what is the difference between the, those browser browser tools versus CI/CD? Uh, first of all, browser tools are much faster to work with. Because like I mentioned, with CI/CD tools, we have to uh, push a code change to our Git repository, and then it will run in the background, and then we will get the response. While with browser tools, we just press the button, and we already have the response. They are also easier to use uh, because you just have to require uh, they, you just have to install an add-on to your browser. It's like one or two clicks and you're done. While to run a CI/CD pipeline in general, uh, you require a bit more knowledge, uh, so it's much harder to do. Uh, but on the other hand. Uh, you don't have to remember about CI/CD tests because they will be the part of the testing suite. They will always happen. And what's important with browser testing, you can skip it. You just, it's just up to you. Will you remember to test your website? Or maybe you will start <clears throat> cheating yourself and just push whatever you have. With CI/CD tools, it's impossible because if it's a test that is a part of the pipeline, it will always, always run. So let's compare them. I will show you um, what is the difference in time of running a CI/CD pipeline versus uh, testing a, a, a site with X in the browser. So on the left, we see a, a pipeline. And on the right, we see, of course, X. And um, as we see, we already have X ready. And few seconds later, we got uh, this uh, the X the X run that that run in the CI CD pipeline. It took a bit longer. Uh, I would say we would have a chance to drink a small espresso. It a bit depends on the website, uh, but the difference isn't that huge. But it was kind of an unrealistic case because when we will be using, when we will be running a CI CD pipeline, in most cases, uh, we will test everything, not only accessibility. So the more realistic case would look like this. Uh, on the right, we still have nothing changed, the X like it was, but now we are running unit tests, uh, functional tests, and accessibility tests. So 
this takes a bit longer. And as you see, we already could be drinking coffee while waiting for, for, for the result. And especially that some CICD pipelines can take about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Uh, yeah, we would drink a lot of coffee during this, uh, this, this waiting time. So what should we use, browser or CICD tools? The answer is, I mean, in IT, in most cases, we would use the term, it depends, but not this time. Both, of course, both, because they have a bit different uh, reason to exist. Uh, first of all, we have to remember that browser tools are far superior when it comes to the moment when we are developing something. We can constantly check if our code is correct, if we didn't make a mistake or something like this. CICD tools are perfect, so we can be sure that the code we are pushing to production is correct, that no one skipped something. Also, when we are using a, a, a browser tool, in most cases, we will be concentrating on this, only on the place on which we are working at. So for example, uh, if we are uh, fixing something on the contact page, we will be only testing the contact page, but it may produce something called regression. So a fix that changed something on contact uh, created a error on some different place of our, our website, let's say on our blog, because we used something from, from, from the contact page. And probably we will miss it using the browser tool, but thanks to the CI CD tool, when we would list multiple pages to test, we would find that, yeah, we caused the regression, we have to fix it. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, it was, uh, I'm, I'm really proud to be a, a part of this conference. And uh, if you would have any questions, uh, even after the conference, don't forget to reach me out on Twitter or sign up to my newsletter on newsletter.machikpalmowski.dev. So are there any questions? Thank you so much, Machak. Um, if you're watching live, you can use the Q&A section to the right of the video stream to ask your questions. Um, I have some of my own, so until I see some coming into the private <laughs> chat, is that okay if I just pick your brain here? <laughs> of course, I'm. Yeah. that's why I'm here. <laughs> awesome. So for me, I've seen when we have testing like this, it's kind of training our developers to you know, see those issues and then maybe learn and write better code from the start. So could you speak to how that, how you've seen that happen in yourself or other developers that you've worked with um, having CICD part of the development process? Uh, yes, this is exactly what, because let me say this like this, developers are lazy. I know this from experience because that's why I got into automate into this whole automation proce uh, process because, uh, I wanted to save my time. And there are machines that can do things for me. And the same happens here. And at some, because we are lazy, we don't like to fix the same errors over and over and over. That's why we will learn how to, the, those basics of accessibility. In most cases, um, not because we want to learn accessibility, but because we don't want to see this error anymore. Uh, it's, it may be a quite pragmatical approach, but the result counts. We will have an accessible product. And, and on the other hand, the developer won't be frustrated because he will learn that, yes, adding this alternative text to an image wasn't something that difficult. And, and, this, and it's like I won't get a notice that, hey, there is an error in your code. It was that easy. So. So, so yeah, it's, um, I really see that uh, apart from uh, just checking if our application is okay, it's also about the learning, about this eye opening. So, and it works. Oh, that's really good. Um, another question I had um, relates to um, creating those first tests. And um, I know when people have no tests written for their code, whether that's a website, 
the website code or a plugin code or a theme code, it can be daunting, like where to start. Do you have recommendations for the first places to look at for this? Or um, I may have missed it in the beginning. Are there existing libraries that you can use that kind of Thanks. have some, uh, some scans in place? Most in, in most cases, and this is also the great part about, uh, for example, using the XCLI, you don't have to write any test because it mostly scans your website. Of course, you can at some point start adding your own test, and this is great. But by default, just to check if the website is good enough, just run the XCLI. So there is no additional work when it comes to creating the test, because as you mentioned, uh, when you have a blank slate and at some point someone uh, tells you, now we are testing it, you're mm -hmm. like, oh. Oh God, what to do now? I don't know what, how to start. But uh, this is one of those tools when uh, the only problem that you will have is uh, in the worst case, okay, we have 100 errors. What to do now? <laughs> but that's simple. You just ask, add 100 tasks and go step by step. <laughs> do you have recommendations for um, when you run these scans and the code is kind of outside of your control? If it's in a plugin, if it's in a theme, how... Have you found it successful to work with those authors? You know, these are open source products um, often, you would hope. So how have you found success kind of pushing back or requesting the changes that are outside of the website's code itself? Uh, first of all, I'm in, in most cases, I try to limit um, being... Re uh, I, I try to limit the number of plugins uh, because of uh, I'm kind of a control freak. I always feel better when I am in, in, in full control because uh, there are many cases and this is one, one, one of those when it can be annoying that, um, for example, you are finishing this public website and the only problem is not you, it's the plugin. And uh, of course, uh, in most cases, uh, from, at least from what, what I remember, I was always able to fix everything, at least on the front end. The back end is always uh, a, a bit different uh, part of the of the of the equation, and uh, I still think that um, when we talk about accessibility, uh, at least here now in Poland, we only see the front end right now. So we still need some some time to to get. Uh, about the backend, but but still, uh, it is possible. It, it I mean, it's it's also one of the uh, things that differences a good a good company from uh, a good plugin company from a bad one. If they will just say no, we won't fix it. It's impossible. It's just accessibility. It's just a sign that okay, it's a bad plugin. Sorry, I don't want to use you. Yeah, people should be open to hear that feedback and make those changes. Um, I'm sure they aren't often major changes. It's adding simple things to where images are rendered, like you said, to um, form elements and, and fixing certain things. So hopefully it's not 100 for the developer, but, you know. <laughs> um, exactly, exactly. Yes, I mean, this is the thing about accessibility uh, is we have to remember uh, that it's a process. It's a process. It's it's, it's 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 not a task that we will finish. I mean, I lately see that there are many things, uh, especially in, in the web development, that are a process. We are talking about performance that is constantly changing. We are talking about the general experience, which is also changing. And the part of this experience is, again, accessibility, which is also a process because everything changes, everything changes. We have access to new hardware. We learn things about uh, something that we never knew before. And so we have to constantly adapt. And this is something really, I mean, this is really fascinating. This is really fascinating because uh, it never will, will get boring. Also the fact of this, uh, that I mentioned, 60% uh, of issues can be solved in an automatic way. I remember that in some documentation from few years ago, we could read about 20, 30%. So this is growing. And I also can't wait what will start happening at the moment when we'll start using AI for accessibility testing. 
because there are many problems with accessibility that aren't code related. They are about logic, uh, about how we written the text. And this is something we, at the moment, without any AI, can't check because those are just words. And thanks to AI, they are starting to have uh, to have a uh, to have meaning. You mentioned AI. Do you use um, GitHub Copilot and anything? I, I haven't used it, but I don't know if it's helpful for I'm, I'm, um, some I'm of kind these of afraid. things. You're afraid. I'm kind of afraid, <laughs> and I'm. I I will also be honest. I'm not fully. Uh, I don't fully trust all those big corporations, especially that I know that there is a lawsuit. Uh, they are planning a lawsuit against Copilot about is the open source code uh, used in a way that it should be used. So there are many things. I mean, uh, AI also changed so many things about how we, especially for open source, because we shared our code and now why someone is using it, why someone is earning money without mentioning us. Many inter interesting things. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. I think our moderator had a few questions, so we'll see if, if they come into the private chat here. Um, <laughs> I'm looking back at my notes. <laughs> we mentioned, let's talk about something totally unrelated. You're um, working <laughs> on the WP Owls newsletter. What got you oh, started yes, in that? You can just share a little, be a little promotional and get some sign up. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it started in a quite funny way because at some point uh, my wife asked me, hey, maybe we'll start doing a WordPress newsletter. And I'll be honest, I wasn't listening carefully. So I just nodded and said, yeah. <laughs> and uh, this was the Polish edition that uh, right now has more than 200 issues. So 200 weeks weeks ago, I just nodded without listening. And, uh, and yes, here we are. <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's cool. I also work with my partner. I don't know how involved um, your wife is in the newsletter ongoing, but it's fun to work with your spouse, right? <laughs> I mean, we work at most of companies for most of our lives together. Yeah. So uh, now at, at, at Kinsta, this is kind of a, a, a change where, where, where we are working separately, but uh, who knows? Maybe at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I really love working with her. So it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's something normal for me. There you I, I go, right? I think when you haven't done it, you, it feels very foreign to work with your partner. But then when you do, you're like, oh, this is this is how we do things. Yeah, it's, We're good. it's yeah. great. It's, it's really great. It's, 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 it's always the, per, the, the person you know. And <laughs> and especially that we had all, a, a, a bit um, our specializations uh, worked really great together because uh, she's a front-end developer and I was mostly a back-end developer. So it was... Uh, a great combo. <laughs> I'll ask this question from our moderator, mm -hmm. Taruk. Um, mm -hmm. It maybe is slightly related to accessibility, but also mm -hmm. your knowledge having been in the WordPress community for, for many years. Mm -hmm. um, um, Taruk asks, uh, can you tell us how students can be involved in WordPress for a school purpose? Um, and is there a possibility of students working um, together with WordPress without too much knowledge? Or any suggestions you have about getting into the community um, as a student? I think that especially uh, with what is happening right now, this this push toward this no code, low code uh, approach, I think that WordPress is more accessible to everyone. Because when I started using WordPress, uh, let's be honest, it was most mostly for geeks and nerds. Uh, so, so, so I think that. Uh, WordPress by default got more accessible to everyone. You don't need to have any specialized knowledge to uh, to start building. So uh, the only thing that you need is to the will to learn. So it's it's, it's I think it's very it's very simple to start. Uh, then uh, the next step, um, especially after meeting our community, because our WordPress community is uh, is different. It's different, but it's different in a good way. Um, and uh, as I, I would really recommend attending some uh, some some WordCamp to to feel the whole vibe to uh, take part in a contributor day because especially contributor they can uh, open your eyes to find uh, to find something that might interest you more in in the WordPress space because. 
I remember while we were uh, organizing a uh, word camp in, in, in my city, in Łódź, uh, during Contributor Day, one of our uh, biggest problems was to explain people that Contributor Day is not for developers. Contributor Day is for everyone. You can be a translator, a designer, and the whole long list of people, uh, of, of roles uh, that can be filled. So if you have this will to learn and you will find something that interests you, that's it. It's really, I, I think that uh, out of all all the CMSs uh, out there, uh, WordPress is the most friendly to uh, to start with. Yeah, I would totally agree. I would suggest joining the Make WordPress Slack if you're not a member yet. Mm -hmm. um, there's various teams in there, and it's it's like virtual contributor day all the time. Um, and exactly. there are teams I think that have online you know, scheduled meetups or just chats in the Slack areas. And and like Machek said, not all developer focused um, ways you can okay. contribute to like education, to documentation, um, just to community efforts in general. So um, it can be a busy Slack channel to be a part of. So use that mute and, and only be in the channels or have them active, the ones that you really like to be a part oh, yes. of. Um, yeah. I'm, I, 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 I might be like... plugins channel is a little scary. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's true. I, I made this mistake once and it was like constantly pinging me and uh, this was, uh, okay, mute, 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 mute. <laughs> no, for sure. Yeah, but uh, but 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 still uh, the best, and, and, and because like I said, our community is, is, is so different that uh, I think that meeting those people from from, from from the community is one of the most important things. I mean, it's also uh, a good idea for for schools to to get involved with with other members to organize some show and tells and things like this. I mean, I still remember uh, how much meeting Alain Chassera from uh, during WordCamp London meant to me. It was, I mean, he is a WordPress rockstar. Rockstar. So when you meet someone like this and he helps you finding this bug that you had and everything. It was like amazing. And I, I, I never felt that uh, I'm talking to a rock star. I just felt that, yeah, I just talking to a, to a friend. That's yeah, there's definitely, the first you know, time, but... <laughs> through the pandemic, there were people I would reach out to on a Twitter or in the make Slack and just ask for 15 minutes of their time. And I always found people really friendly and receptive and, um, yeah, there's still a pretty active meetup community also with virtual meetups. So I guess that's mm -hmm. a way to kind of meet some people and get to know things. But I think the return of in-person WordCamps on a broader scale will really help younger people in this community because you've, you've been, you know, two years without that face-to-face, -face, without, you know, feeling that energy that we all got to feel for all those years leading up to the pandemic. So um, yeah, I, I think it's probably I, I been a hard the couple of years. Europe. WordCamp Europe was one big hug fest. That's it. <laughs> we were just constantly, everyone was hugging each other. And <laughs> Our uh, producer here said that WordCamp EU was amazing. So oh, yeah, was, more votes was, for yeah. that. And I'm sure there'll be more I, I, to come. I really missed it. I Will really you be going to WordCamp it. Asia? No, sadly, sadly not. Um, at least not this 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 year. But who knows? I I really hope to uh, to visit all those flagship word camps at at some point because uh, yeah. why not? Why not? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh, and I see one more question. Can you tell us a little more? How can um, one protect their database? from your experience. Um, I mean, just the regular things, having a, a good hosting, because it's important, having, uh, y y using updated versions of MySQL, MariaDB, not using weak codes. I mean, in general, it's simple. It's, I, I, I sometimes feel that uh, it's kind of scary when we think about security. Uh, because security is quite simple. It consists of many, many simple things, but the amount of them sometimes make causes that we make 
an error. We forgot about something. And it can cause to a bigger tragedy. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. And, you know, strong passwords for your own WordPress account. Um, strong passwords, you know, and most good hosts are going to give you a strong password for if you do have access to log into the hosting environment and to, exactly. to your hosting account directly. Um, for sure. And take backups, you know, the best, your best friend is your backups for sure. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And take them and how, put how, them in places other than your web host environment. So have backups for your backups and, and put them everywhere. And what's important, test your backups. Oh, right. Git, uh, I remember GitLab uh, once had this problem. They had backups, but they never tested it. And it turns out they didn't have backups. <laughs> Yeah, can you restore? That is key. That is a super key. Um, we do have a oh. question from Nobird. Mm -hmm. How much time does it usually take to set up a basic CI CD pipeline from scratch, which includes the accessibility testing without writing the tests? So just mm -hmm. that portion of the pipeline setup. I think that um, if you are not having any experience with it, um, the most basic example that would automate uh, all the build process, deploy, and for example, add this uh, accessibility testing would take, I don't know, totally few hours. That's it. That's because um, it also will. It, it also depends on which which application will you use because some are a bit more difficult to start with. For example, GitLab CI is at least. For me, it was always very complicated. And on the other hand, we have those more simple tools, like for example, Body. Like for example, I think it's also Deploy HQ. Uh, they have the they they have a visual interface, so it's much much uh, much simpler to to start with. And uh, using those tools, like I said, it should take because it's. At the beginning, it's always a bit trial and error. You have to uh, test something. So at first, always only play around with staging. Don't risk. And I am saying this as a person who once maybe deleted the whole website because he done a small typo in the folder name. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That's why you have to help. Z, undo. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, so, uh, but but in general, mm, ov overall, I always uh, try to say that when it comes to starting with CI/CD, go step by step, slowly. Start with the continuous delivery deployment part. So first, think only about automating the deployments. That's it. Then start building if you have some node modules or you want to compress your JavaScript. Or, so this is another thing. And at the end, start adding tests. The cool part about accessibility testing, it's like I mentioned, it's simple. It's just running the CLI tool. So you can uh, you can add those no or low configuration tests like accessibility testing, like PHP stand. It's also quite easy, but for, for, for developers. And in the end, you go with those most difficult where you have to write tests. So this whole workflow, creating it, probably can take even years. But it doesn't matter. It's important to just go step by step, have some progress. Because every time you will add this extra step, you will save yourself a lot of time. The more project, the more, uh, project on which you are working uh, at, the bigger uh, save of time you'll see. So it's, it's worth it. Have you seen in these teams that it's like an individual person's um, role to be the one that addresses the errors that come up with the accessibility testing in the CICD or how, I guess, depending on team size, it could be the person who does everything or how have you seen that work? Uh, that's, the, the sad part was that in most uh, companies, uh, there was none, and there was just this. Sometimes there was this person uh, who knew about accessibility and was arguing with the rest of the team that, hey, there is something like accessibility, let's do it. I mean, I was constantly arguing with the designers <laughs> because they never understood why it's also their role uh, to 
think about accessibility because we are artists. We create art. No, you are not. Websites aren't art. Websites are engineering. It's some. I mean, it can look nice, but still, uh, it's engineering. It's not whatever you want to paint. It's like cars. They may look beautiful, but underneath there is an engine. There is a lot of technology, and that's it. I love the way you referred to that. That's very true, and and there can be these kind of battles within an organization where some people are more of an advocate, like you said, um, for the accessibility route and, and other people are more protective of their art, you know, but we all want to build functional websites that achieve whatever their goal is. Um, if the goal is to just look pretty, that's one thing, but if it has to be usable, it has to be usable by all of us. So that's exactly. a real challenge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, and, and like I said, then, I, I also think that, uh, and this is again this, this this problem with the lack of education. That um, uh, because I think that still developers are a bit more advanced when it comes to accessibility when the uh, com comparing to design teams. At least in, in, in my cases, I, I I hope that I'm mistaken, but uh, because it's like this that for some reason. Many think that these, uh, that developers are are the people responsible for fixing the website to pass the accessibility. It even sounds horrible because it's we are not taking care of accessibility. We are taking care of fixing things to make it make it pass. So it's it's it's, it's a horrible approach. And and the truth the truth is that I really think that the design team has the biggest impact because it's their vision and. Uh, it's not only about the contrast. It's not only about the colors. It's about the general idea. So, for example, if we are thinking about using, I don't know, uh, rich videos and and everything, okay, let's do it. But also think, what about accessibility? How will we provide the same content to people who just won't experience the videos? So, and this is not about painting the website. It's about the general ID that stands behind it. So, uh, so, so, so I think that the designers really don't have, uh, don't, don't, don't fully understand how enormous impact they have on, 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 on the website's accessibility. Um, Truk asks, you know, what are the challenges people, what are the highest challenges people face at the beginning? So some of these tests um, you mentioned, the, the number text of text on the image is just the number. It can feel overwhelming. Yes, because uh, if you develop the website and never never thought about accessibility, and at some point you will run the test, and uh, I mean, quite quickly when you after the first frustration phase and anger phase, because they 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 will be there. They will be present. Uh, you will start just seeing that okay lack of uh, alternative text for images. So you started fixing it and 100 turns into 50. Okay, and now another simple fix. And in the end, it will turn out there are just few more difficult uh, fixes to, to, well, to fix. <laughs> to That's awesome. I, I think I'm gonna wrap it up now. I thank you so much for being with us. Are there any closing remarks that you have? I think all, all of your education, oh, they took them away, Never mind. Sorry, my check. <laughs> Um, cool. Well, thank you for attending this session with this session with Maciek Palmowski. Uh, you can continue the conversation in the chat or on social media using our hashtags WPA11Y Day or WPAD2022. Uh, we appreciate if you would go to WPAccessibility.day forward slash feedback to provide your anonymous feedback for our speakers on their presentations. Um, you can also enter to win a t-shirt when you're there submitting your feedback. Um, the next session is on designing a web page for the Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, with Ole Goldberg and Anna Ingborg Lynette at 10 a.m. UTC. While you're waiting, you can visit our sponsors page to grab some virtual swag uh, and enter for a chance to win some great prizes. So um, we're going to reset the chat um, and then there'll be new chat available to you uh, for the next session. So I'll see you right here after the break.